morning to all of you. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And Barbara, thank you for the invitation to uh, attend. Can all of you hear me in the back? Is this working all right? Um, I, uh, okay, thanks for the introduction. And thanks for keeping it short. Uh, she didn't get into my prison record, which would have, <laughs> the, um, the subject today, the title on the screen, uh, what do we tell our students is really a pretentious title. Uh, there's no answer, but that, that is the perennial question. And in any, any school or for any educator, uh, the issue is, is how do we explain our times to young people uh, in a way that uh, improves their lives and the, the work that they do in the world. So, uh, and I don't know, uh, to be quite frank, and I'll explain why I don't know uh, as we go through. Um, I do worry about this generation. I think there is cause for all of us to worry about this generation of students more than perhaps uh, educators had to worry in the past. Uh, this generation of kids sees, on average, I'm told, something like 5,000 commercial messages per day. There are pop-ups on their uh, computer, there are billboards, there are all kinds of signage and so forth, but 5,000 messages per day. This is the largest effort ever to deflect human intelligence uh, to commercial uh, exploitation. They live in a world increasingly without silence where it's harder to find time to reflect and, and cogitate. Uh, the uh, USA Today yesterday had an article saying that they spend more time in front of little screens, smartphones, than they do sleeping. Uh, Richard Louvre has documented the, the fact that they spend less and less time out of doors. And they live in a world where the big numbers are, whatever you make of them, they're, they're changing dramatically. And I'll mention carbon in the uh, atmosphere, but also they live in a world of population explosion, a term that has been around for a long time and probably roundly abused, but uh, there are 7.2 billion of us on Earth presently. There will be uh, before if they live a normal, what we take to be a normal lifespan, there will be upwards of 10 to 11 billion on the planet, all wishing to live more or less like Americans do presently. So what do, do we tell uh, our students? Uh, and how do we say it? And after we've said it, what do we do then? And that's kind of what I'd like to reflect on. Um, I've been reading William Dorisowitz's uh, Excellent Sheep uh, in an article he had in uh, Harper's a month or so back, uh, really good reading for in both counts. Uh, it's about higher education. How many of you have read this? Let me see a show of hands. So maybe a third of you or so. Uh, if you haven't read it, it, it is worth reading. And, and it's a, uh, his reflections are um, uh, very thoughtful. The Harper's article, which uh, I think is about two months back or maybe three, uh, is really a wonderful uh, meditation on liberal education, what it means at this uh, particular time. So having said that, let me, let me begin. Um, in 1992, uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists in Cambridge uh, pulled together a statement that was made uh, by 1,500 and some scientists, including 102 Nobel laureates. And the words on the screen are uh, what that statement said. And it, it didn't uh, have much more impact than a bug hitting a windshield of a semi at, on the interstate at 75 miles an hour. It, it just didn't deflect anything. Uh, and that has been typical of the U.S. press. When uh, a report came out in 2005 that uh, uh, biological diversity on the planet was in free fall, basically declining rapidly, and that was a global study, that made page eight of the New York Times. Uh, page one was about Terry Schiavo. Do you remember the woman who was uh, declared to be brain dead and there was a big battle over whether to pull the plug on her or not? But that was page one of the New York Times, our national newspaper. Uh, page eight was the fact, oh, by the way, life on the planet is deteriorating very rapidly, the ecological substrate uh, which we draw on. Uh, so what do we tell young people? Um, on one hand, you remember Jack Nicholson, A Few Good Men? at uh, one of the great scenes in American cinematography history where uh, Tom Cruise, the young JAG attorney, has got Nicholson on the stage, and Nicholson's a commandant of the Marine Corps base. How many of you have seen the movie? Well, they, then you know Nicholson, and this is, this is really a lousy interpretation, but you can't handle the truth, remember that? Except he said it a lot better than that. Uh, and there is a viewpoint. Uh, T.S. Eliot, the uh, American British poet, uh, put it in Burton Norton that the humankind can't bear much reality. 
And then there's the other uh, extreme of this. Uh, Winston Churchill in 1940, bombs falling on London. Um, Churchill doesn't go on BBC to tell the British people, hey, this is really, really a great time to, for urban renewal in London. We can finally build the city that Christopher Wren wanted us to build after the London fire in 1666 or whatever. Uh, he just says very plainly that uh, he has nothing to offer, blood and toil and tears and sweat. So these are the two kind of bookends within, within which a communication strategy has to evolve. Uh, if humankind can't bear much reality, then the people who can become kind of an elite. That's uh, uh, Plato's guardians, and that comes through Leo Strauss in our own political theory history, and that was partly uh, the training that uh, the men, and they were all men, I think, uh, that led us into the Iraq war had about that particular conflict. Whatever your politics are, that was their political philosophy. Some were students of Leo Strauss. And uh, if Churchill's right, on the other hand, you have to mobilize lots of people. And you have to summon them to do uh, their duty, which means that they have to see themselves and their lives and their work in this larger perspective. For Churchill, it was the British Empire and Western civilization and so forth. Uh, the, the the difference in, in this is, and I think one of the difficulties for our time is that for Churchill, it, it's fairly easy to summon people to do their duty and to be heroic if the conflict or if the battle is going to be you know, three or four or five years. I, if, it, if it doesn't take too long, then it's a lot easier to get people to stay focused on conflict. But if it's going to be longer, uh, we lose patience and we get bored and we, we defect uh, from the cause, so to speak. So communication strategies. Um, this is one of my favorite, can all of you see that? This is one of my favorite cartoons. Uh, it's a Booth, New Yorker cartoon. And Reverend Millstone's sermon, Are We All Prostitutes, had kind of predictable uh, results. And there, there are some things that we, we don't say or we should not say or that are impolitic or even inaccurate. Uh, that's one communication strategy and it's one that uh, I think sometimes it's used in various causes, but it is to uh, summon, I think, probably the worst of us. Gary Larson, you know, where's Gary Larson when we really need him as a cartoonist? This is Gary Larson's view, and this is another communication strategy, which is simply totally ineffect ineffective. She's yelling down to her presumably husband or boat companion, Ernie, to rub his belly. And so that's another way to be ineffective uh, or irrelevant. Uh, Mark Twain put it this way, when in doubt, tell the truth, it amazes your friends and confounds your enemies. Uh, so given, given the numbers of the time, and, and you and I as educators are obliged to tell the truth as best we can see it, but in a way that uh, galvanizes, catalyzes, encourages, and inspires the best. But this isn't a normal time, and this is part of the, the reason. Let me go through just a few slides on climate change. These are the things you've all seen. This is from NASA, September 2015. Uh, this is a climate map of uh, the world. And one of the great uh, advances of science in the past uh, hundreds of years actually has been the capacity to take the temperature of the Earth very accurately. And the science is really quite remarkable. So these are increasingly accurate mapping or maps of uh, temperature on planet Earth and the, uh, the conditions on Earth. Um, Reduced to sheer numbers, 2015, uh, partly driven by ocean conditions in the uh, Pacific, but uh, 2015 is by and, by and large runaway the hottest year recorded. And the records began about 1880, became increasingly accurate as science got better and better. Now with global satellites, uh, we know with great precision what the temperature of the planet is. And so this year is, uh, here we are in, uh, what, November 5th, uh, uh, I'll be out in a t-shirt this afternoon, probably walking around the grounds here, as many of you will, if you can escape meetings. And I don't know if you can or not. Uh, is this mandatory? You've got to be in meetings. <laughs> I'm not encouraging a jailbreak now. I'm not, I'm not doing that. But this is uh, part of the temperature record. And then there's this. And all of you have seen charts like this. I don't want to dwell on this, but I do want to dwell a bit on the implications. We, we now know from ice core records and from uh, an amazing scientific performance of the past 20 years, we now know that uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and temperature, along with uh, 
or other gases like uh, methane, CH4, uh, run basically in tandem. That does not say cause and effect, although it's increasingly clear that uh, it can probably work either way. But in our case, it is the precursor carbon that's driving up temperature. And so those are the, uh, uh, those are the waypoints. And somewhere along, the, uh, along that pathway that we're now walking rather rapidly, uh, all hell breaks loose. At some point, as temperature increases, civilization will be in jeopardy if it is not already. And there are a couple of things about this that are important. One is that there's a lag between what comes out of our tailpipes and smokestacks. It's estimated now to be around 30 years. It will decline to 20 years as oceans acidify. But there's a lag between the climate change-driven weather effects that we see uh, or experience uh, and the actual uh, forcing effect. So we're not seeing the, the anomalies we're seeing now. We just came back from California two weeks ago, and the California drought is real, as are the bigger storms in Asia and the ones hitting in the Middle East and so forth. These are unusual events. We're seeing hottest hots, wettest wets, driest dries, windiest wind conditions, and so forth. These weren't supposed to happen until mid-century at a forcing level much higher than we are now. We've raised the temperature of the Earth about nine-tenths of a degree centigrade. Uh, with another roughly half a degree, give or take, uh, in the pipeline, no matter what we do. And so uh, there is this lag effect, and that's important to recognize. We're not seeing the effects of where we are. We're at about 401 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, but we're still seeing the effects of somewhere around 370, 375. But that gap will decline as oceans acidify and warm, because the oceans have been the big thermal anchor. They've been uptaking carbon, and the reason we're not seeing the full effects is that the oceans are not yet saturated uh, with carbon uh, or carbonic acid, but they, they will be before long. That's, that's simply a matter of time. So what does this mean? Well, it doesn't mean uh, as we increase temperature, it doesn't mean that we go up a, centi a centigrade, and this is not uh, in Fahrenheit, this is centigrade. It doesn't mean just on an average day we go up a degree centigrade or two. It means that the poles warm, warm faster than mid-latitudes. So if you really want to see the warming, go north or go south. And an article just appeared in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The uh, Antarctic ice sheet is now known to be, or suspected to be, in danger. It has passed or is close to passing a tipping point. No matter what happens, it will melt. And that is at a forcing level now of 300 and maybe 70 or 75 parts per million CO2. We're already at 400 and 401. So we, we haven't seen the full effects of this. So for if you're a scientist studying this, you're seeing things happen faster at a larger scale than we predicted even a couple of years ago. Jim Hansen, probably the best climate scientist in the world and one of the most prescient going back decades. Jim Hansen <coughs> published a long study, 150 some pages, explaining why ice melting, the cryosphere, uh, is melting much faster than had been predicted. And he was saying that it is possible that we would see a 10-foot, foot now, not, uh, not metric scale, we'd see a 10-foot uh, rise in sea levels by mid-century or 2060. You do the math. Where does 10-foot put New York City or Boston or Savannah or New Orleans and so forth? Or uh, European cities around the world, 100 some 40 cities that lie within the danger zone, coastal cities. Uh, and also coastal croplands, rice lands, and so forth. So as temperature increases, our kind of mental map here is that you can turn the thermostat up over here, but nothing else wobbles over here. That's not the world you see uh, on the evening news or read about in the New York Times of, of a given day. Uh, that's a world where small changes have very large effects. And for the first time in history now, since we've been on the planet, uh, as an identifiable species over the past, say, what, roughly 100,000 years, the planet is changing dramatically because of human activity. And it will change everything. Naomi Klein's uh, book, This Changes Everything, the title gets it right. So in thinking about the Earth as a system and us as a kind of an adjunct uh, part of this system, uh, change the temperature of the planet, you change everything else. You change growing seasons, storms, ecologies, sea levels. You change eventually politics, economics, human health, and so forth. And there is so much evidence. Lancet put out a, uh, the, the British equivalent of the uh, AMA journal, uh, put out a report, a full issue on the health effects of climatic change. 
And it is basically everything. Disease patterns change. If you uh, saw the article in the New York Times uh, several days ago, the Science Times on Tuesday, uh, animals in Siberia dying partly because temperature change or climatic change has warmed the atmosphere enough that it's changed the whole disease regime in which the animals live. So I don't want to dwell on this much longer, but just remember that the science is, uh, the science is such that it does change everything. This is a matter where the thermostat goes up and then everything over here changes. Um, and then the other last thing I want to point out is this. Uh, what you're seeing is a slide on a screen. And if I ask how does your or our Homo sapiens evolutionary experience help us understand the screen, it doesn't. So you see that and you say, well, you know, if he just used a lighter shade of blue and changed the red and so forth and rearranged this a little bit, we're creatures of, first of all, of sight. 70% of our sensory apparatus is connected to our eyes. So we tend to believe what we see. Uh, the reverse is probably also true, but that's a different subject. But we privilege sight. And so we look at that, and there's nothing in our evolutionary past, yours or mine, that would cause us to do a thing about that. We are wired, I if a grizzly bear wanders out through the side of the stage here, it would have your evolutionary attention in a way that I, one of your fellow homo sapiens, can't get it. Uh, you're wired to be fearful of dependably loathsome things and scary things with long teeth and hairy or people that we can uh, dump our, all of our anxieties on, Adolf Hitler or Osama bin Laden and so forth. Uh, we're wired for that, and we're really good for that. It, uh, you know, dependably loathsome enemy shows up or some person or people that we can demonize, we are excellent. We will wipe them out. We will kill them. We're tribal. And our evolutionary experience hasn't prepared us to think through what that means. And so if you ask a kid, and I use sometimes use a slide when I talk on college campuses, I give kids four curves, the McDonald's curve, the Coca-Cola swoosh, and the Nike swoosh, and then the Keeling curve. This basically is the Keeling curve, David, named after David Keeling, who began to measure uh, CO2 in the atmosphere in 1957. And they can identify the three. They, they know the McDonald's curve real well, and the Nike swoosh, and the Coca-Cola thing. You know, they, they know those curves. Show them the Keeling curve and say, how many of you understand the Keeling curve? And maybe even at this late hour in 2015, only a couple hands go up. We haven't taught them to understand what is really fearful in this and what we have to think through. We have to understand the Keeling curve and, and those other curves that uh, Elizabeth Colbert uh, describes uh, uh, in her book, The Sixth Extinction. We have to now think our way through this. And this is why your work and my work as educators is so critically important. Uh, this is a matter now of thinking through better than we ever have our relationship as people to the planet. Um, but uh, again, we're not wired for this. Uh, if, if there is a direct physical threat, we're good because it kicks in the adrenal glands and the fight-flight mechanism and all those things that uh, uh, lurk in the reptilian brain, uh, which is ours. And by the way, the brain that you and I try to educate was never designed. It just kind of evolved layer by layer. It looks, like, uh, looks kind of like Mohawk. It was just built in sections. <laughs> there, was, there was no plan to it, but uh, it's grand. I mean, it, it works in, in a lot of ways, but if you're trying to get from one end of this building to another and, and go up a floor or down a floor, uh, that's pretty tough. Uh, one of the maids told me that if you can't find your way here, they put you on staff. <laughs> so many of the uh, uh, staff people here are former members of your organization. <laughs> um, so here, here's, where, here's where we are. And th this came from Climate Interactive, which is one of the great uh, little research organizations now. The December uh, talks in Paris uh, will take us uh, along this trajectory. And so the yellow line is where we're headed, 4.5 degrees centigrade. That probably would be fatal to civilization. I don't think we would survive that. Uh, William Rees, the astronomer royal from uh, Cambridge University in England, said that he published a book that had uh, the title, and, and this is one of the most distinguished scientists in the world, but it, it, the title was Our Final Hour. And he basically said the odds of us as a species making it to 2100 were 50-50. And then in his next book, he said that he opened the book by saying that many of his climate friends wrote him after that book appeared and said, no, 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 you're way too optimistic. Uh, but that, that probably would be 50-50. That would not be a bad, if you're in some intergalactic betting parlor, uh, that's, that, that's a pretty good uh, estimate. Uh, the 20... Uh, the proposal is currently on the deck uh, would get us maybe 3.5. The head of the UN Climate Agency 
uh, had it the other day, and their report at 2.7 degrees uh, centigrade rise by 2100, and that's a guesstimate. And I want to point out something. And this, I'm sorry for the science here, but some of these things are important. Uh, these depend on there being no wild cards that come into play in that deck. And in particular, self-amplifying are called positive feedback cycles. So as temperature warms, one of the things that is extremely dangerous is that that will help the, in the release by melting uh, boreal ice and boreal forests and ice clathrates in seabeds. That will release CH4, which is methane. And if you follow this debate, methane is much more potent greenhouse gas than is carbon dioxide. Molecule for molecule, methane will trap 20 to 25 times more heat than does a molecule of CO2. If that comes about, end of game. No way. We don't make it. That means that we would take, because of carbon dioxide, because what we burn in our gas-powered engines and furnaces and so forth, uh, that would take us up a couple of degrees. Uh, if we could hold it at two and a half degrees, that would be that would be good, uh, but methane would take us to five, six, seven degrees. We won't survive that. There would be nothing much left of what we call civilization. That's the wild card. So uh, th this is the current data. The goal is two degrees centigrade. I have to explain this, two degrees centigrade, the green line here. Um, that has been called the guardrail, that if we go beyond two degrees centigrade warming, we, in fact, uh, wouldn't survive. Uh, if you, but if you poll climate scientists now and ask, is that really a guardrail, the answer would come back, no, it's not. Uh, it's way too high, that more like a degree and a half, roughly twice where we are presently, a little bit less than twice, but uh, that is probably the best we can hope for. Jim Hansen, and, and there's a, one other little note here, if you get lost in this, we can do some Q&A. Uh, there is the carbon level of the atmosphere now at 401 parts per million. That side is called the forcing level. And then you have to put an asterisk beside that 401 parts, because if I take all the other heat-trapping gases, like methane and like uh, superheat-trapping gases like sulfur hexafluoride, and make those equivalent to carbon dioxide, we're already at somewhere between 450 and 470 parts per million. And then when you see this in science press, it's CO2E, small two, small e. So we're already where we've never been before. And you can take that record back in the science record, and it's well verified, not really in dispute. You can take that back hundreds of thousands of years. And we weren't at that level. Uh, the last time we were at about 400 parts per million, sea levels were somewhere between 15 and 20 feet higher than they are presently. The difference in part is how rapidly we're forcing the atmosphere and so it isn't just the volume of carbon in the atmosphere, it's the fact that we've given the atmosphere a quick jolt of carbon and other heat-trapping gases. So probably enough on this, and you're probably all depressed and getting ready to leave, but let me throw one other curve in this. Um, if you talk to Europeans or uh, people from China or India about this, you don't get much debate about the science. Uh, in this country, uh, it's different. Americans have a very different kind of psychology. We're, quote, optimists, and we like optimists, and we, we're problem solvers, and we fix things, and our technology is our crowning jewel in our culture. But the fact is that the problem I've been describing isn't solvable by any known means as we customarily use that word. It doesn't really apply. If you have a uh, broken carburetor on a Ford pickup truck, which I had frequently, uh, that's fixable, and we're really good at mechanical things, and we're good at a lot of technological things now involving electronics and so forth. Carbon in the atmosphere isn't solvable in the same way. There are no known means to pull out carbon out of the atmosphere, despite a good bit of effort to do that. And you think of what has to happen. It's got to be itself carbon neutral. It's got to be deployed at a pace that really, and scale, that really affects the problem, which is roughly 9 billion tons of new carbon in the atmosphere every year. You can just tick it off every year, 9 billion more tons. And that rate has actually been going up, although it stabilized last year. So what this means is this isn't a quick crisis. And the word crisis implies, uh, James Howard Kunstler used uh, the phrase, the long emergency, which I'm using in the subtitle of my next book. This is a long emergency. 
Susan Solomon, one of the great climate scientists of our time, recorded uh, in the fourth uh, International uh, Panel on Climate Change report, or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, that if we were to stop emitting carbon today, uh, we would have a thousand years minimum before ecosystems would restabilize at a new equilibrium. In the meantime, over that thousand years, rising temperatures, rising seas, changing ecologies, changing disease patterns, and so forth, that's what we've got. We dug ourselves a very, during this fossil fuel bonfire, we dug ourselves a very deep hole. Now we have to figure out how to get out of it. I will explain. I think that we can get out of it, but let there be no mistake, this, this is the science. Uh, this is not David Orr's opinion. This, in fact, is the science. Uh, what I've described is roughly a consensus among 99% plus of the people who study climate for a living and have to live by the rigors of peer review, fact, data, logic, and evidence. And so we've gotten all bollocked up about this. People say, I've had people in audiences say, I don't believe in climate change. My, <laughs> my only answer is, look, uh, the word belief doesn't work. Uh, if you apply that to Moses, Jesus, and Buddha, that works. That, that's a matter of belief. But nobody comes up to you and says, you know, I really don't believe in the laws of gravity. Uh, and if they do, there's a quick, easy test. Come to the top of the uh, tower here at Mohonk, and, and let's check it out. You jump first. <laughs> um, the word belief doesn't fit. This is physics, and it's chemistry, and it's verifiable, and it lives in this world of science, and there has never been uh, a greater gap between the science on one side of this chasm and public policy on the other. We've known about climate change. Uh, the first warning given by U.S. President was Lyndon Johnson in 1965. Uh, I worked for Jimmy Carter's transition team in, in uh, 1976, and uh, Jimmy Carter, the, uh, Governor Carter at that time, wanted a uh, report uh, on the most serious issue his administration would face. And it was uh, I put together, I was charged with doing this, we put together a panel that included people like Amory Lovins and uh, some of the great climate scientists and environmental thinkers of the time, and uh, we, we knew it then. And the warnings have gotten increasingly stringent. You saw one, the, the uh, world scientist warning to humankind, that was just one of many. But there, there's a line in the Cole Krauss book, uh, The History of Love, in which he says, we, there were rumors of unfathomable things, and because we couldn't fathom them, we didn't believe them until it was too late and we had no choice. She was describing villagers in Poland prior to the Nazi onslaught, and we are much in the same boat. Now we've got to play catch up. Uh, one final slide on this. Uh, if I was going to give a <laughs> really depressing presentation, I would go around this. This is an article, a graphic from an article that appeared in Nature magazine uh, done by a group of uh, European climate scientists, and they, they survey the number of things. If you, if you imagine a, an airplane cockpit, and the cockpit has its gauges and dials, and you would include all the things around the perimeter here, ocean acidification and species extinction and climate change and so forth. So those dials would have a danger zone. So what they did here is very simply to put this out. Uh, this is a safe space for hum humankind as they describe it. We're already out of the danger zone and moving out in all of these areas. And there's some that are simply unknown. We don't know, uh, we don't survey a lot of these things, so we don't uh, have accurate data. But if you ask, the, and the question here with this graphic is just a very big question, what is the health of the planet? Short answer is not good. And there's not much reason for optimism across any of these things. The great work of this generation, yours and mine and all the students that are in our schools, is to turn this situation around. Now, one piece of good news is a prelude to what follows. This is happening. Worldwide, there is a global, if I stood here uh, 10 years ago, so when I talked to you all, this group, uh, some years back, um, if I said there was a worldwide movement, I would have been blowing smoke, but there, in fact, is a worldwide movement. People are galvanized and organizing all across uh, the earth. Every, you can't go to a country where there's not an environmental movement or a climate movement or a movement toward energy efficiency. A couple other thoughts here. What do you tell, what do we tell young people about our politics? We now know that Exxon Mobil knew exactly what they were doing uh, as early as 1977 from their own scientists. They dedicated or they had... Uh, 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 mandated a group of scientists in the organization to study climate change and the effects of burning their primary product, which is oil and gas and so forth. They knew as early as 1977. This uh, is an ad I particularly like because this is way back when they were called ESSO, remember? 
Each day, humble supplies enough energy to melt seven million tons of glacier. And by God, they're doing it. They have lived up to their. And then what are we telling about US politics now? This unholy alliance of coal and fossil fuels and natural gas and the American political structure. What do we tell them? Uh, this is uh, a tough question. So let me uh, stop here and, sh and shift gears. That's all the bad news you're going to get. And you're saying to yourselves, thank God. <laughs> You're looking for a coffee break. I can see people looking down at their smartphones and checking their shoelaces and so forth. Uh, what do we do about that? And here's what I don't know. But I think if we tell the truth in as palatable a form as we can, as scientifically accurate as we possibly can within the what are called the error bars of any kind of scientific study, there's some parts you just don't know and there's certain wiggle room in these things, but between the most optimistic and pessimistic kind of thing, uh, what do we tell our students? And I think if we tell them the truth, as we are required to do, or supposed to do, or mandated to do, then we raise the energy level. What do we do with that energy level? And they, they will direct it one way or another. They'll, they'll direct it to you know, eat, drink, and be merry, which they're very good at at that age, uh, or constructively. And so there's a, a real gap, uh, and I don't have an answer for this. This is not a well thought out, well considered thing uh, in the scholarly sense. But what I began to realize early, fairly early in the teaching career at Oberlin, I've been at Oberlin for 25 years, was that you had to give them something positive to do. And they had to, it had to be reduced to the scale uh, in which they can get their heads around at the age of 18. Because there's a lot going, as you know, there's a lot going on in their heads. There's a, what, what do you call it, this uh, harmonic uh, or harmonic, uh, all their hormones are in storm. Or what, what, what do you call that? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. But they're in turmoil, and they're trying to figure out, who am I? Where do I fit, and how do I handle all these urges and you know, fantasies and everything that are going through my head and my body? So th it's a rough period. And it doesn't end when, they, when you send them off to Oberlin, which I hope you do. But uh, it, it goes on for some years, probably till about the years 25 or so, give or take, according to what, what I hear from the uh, medical people. So how do we redirect this? It's a critical period of time. And so what we did in, in my role at Oberlin, and I presented this uh, the last time I talked to this group uh, a million years ago. We started this in 1995, and because of the way this project evolved, we needed, I was the chair of the Environmental Studies Program, we needed a building to house our program, and we had no space that was available, and had this program was starting to burgeon, and so the college told me, I, if we, we can build an Environmental Studies Center, but you have to raise all the money, and you can't go to any donor, uh, ever likely, under any conditions, ever to give to Oberlin College. So I used to joke that, that left me the Columbia Drug Cartel <laughs> and until they informed me, no, 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 they're ours too. Uh, so what, what I did was to, uh, and we raised all the money and so forth, but uh, what I did was to organize, since it was my project, I could do this as I wanted to do. So I said, let's do this as an educational venture. So we organized uh, uh, 13 public uh, charrettes, had about 250 students, faculty, townspeople, and folks from Pittsburgh, Toledo, Columbus, Ohio, all come into these. And we said, uh, uh, and John Lyle, who's back, one of the great, uh, one of the great people uh, in my whole life, died of cancer, but John's down here in the lower, lower picture on the left side. John uh, was the facilitator for those charrettes. And we, we began asking, what kind of building do you want to be educated in? What's it look like? What's it feel like? And, and it was a long, the first charrette was really awkward because uh, we don't ask those kind of questions. Development, and particularly on college campuses, it just sort of happens. Uh, and people get very angry about it if it blocks their view or whatever, but it just sort of happens. We were saying, how do you want it to happen? What, what building, what statement do you want to make in this building? Where do you want to learn? And what's the connection between architecture and pedagogy? And there's a pretty intimate connection between them. Uh, we live and work in spaces that are pretty anonymous. They don't tell any story. Where did the materials come from? How are they supported? Where did that rug on your feet come from? What, what cost to whom and where? where the timber come from and so forth. But there, there are, there's a story here. Architecture is a kind of crystallized pedagogy. So the, the kids got into this, uh, and down the, the right-hand margin of this slide were some of the things that came out of the, the building program. They, they, first of all, wanted the building to be um, a zero discharge. The idea was drinking water in, drinking water out. Well, what do you want to have happen in between? And uh, there's several ways you can get to uh, zero discharge. You can put toilets in another building. Uh, <laughs> you can... Uh, ask people to be more disciplined about their habits and so forth. But, uh, and then they wanted the building to be entirely powered by sunshine. Now, I'm, I'm from northern Ohio. We're 14 miles from Lake Erie. Now, northern Ohio is a place where sunshine is a theory. 
this is a bright sunny day in Oberlin. Uh, but they wanted the building to be powered by sunshine. You go down that list, th this is a generation of young people uh, that have lived through a, uh, give or take a century of promiscuous chemistry. And so their uh, fatty tissues and bloodstream show the imprint or have signs of uh, 200 and some uh, organochlorine compounds embedded in them. Uh, we've taken the periodic table and spewed it around the earth in all kinds of forms and fashion. Nature out here uses about four things to make most of what nature does. All the rest are trace elements. But we've taken virtually the whole periodic table in this century of promiscuous chemistry and, and, and they bear the results. And so we, we, so we wanted no toxic chemicals in the building. So that was a building program. This is the result. Uh, it was about a $7.2 million project. We raised about $10 million. Uh, it is a, a building, I think I'm correct in saying this, the only entirely solar powered building on a U.S. college campus 15 years later. And uh, it, uh, the living machine processes wastewater. We met all of the targets and exceeded most all of them. Uh, uh, the AIA, American Institute of Architects panel, uh, chose it as the most significant green building in the past 30 years. But I will tell you that buildings are just buildings. But it gave, it did two things for us. It gave us a bench lab scale experiment. You want to live differently on planet Earth. You want to deal with all that stuff I talked about in the first part of this talk. Uh, you better build differently. Uh, if you have to build, and I mean if you have to build, build in a way that's powered by sunshine, hyper efficient, and all that. And the economics, if you want to talk about economics of this uh, later, the collateral benefits far outweighed whatever extra cost this imposed on us. We made money on this building in all kinds of ways, and I'll explain that if you want to later. But the thing I'm most proud of is the effect on students, because this is just a building. But this was a laboratory in applied hope. How do I take this giant problem of global warming, all the things going wrong in the world, how do I heal one little acre and a quarter site with a 14,200 square foot building? Can I do that? And the answer was yes, you can. So this galvanized uh, at our 10th uh, reunion on this building. Uh, a number of kids came back that had worked on this project. They had started companies, a development company, uh, a high-performance building monitoring company out in California now that's hyper-successful, and you went down this list. They've been galvanized to do things by in being involved in the making of that building. So if you ask what I'm most proud of, buildings are just buildings. It works fine. I mean, we can improve some things periodically, but uh, it's the effect on students. They needed to see hope in a way that they could use in their lives. Uh, and that 70 percent of our sensory apparatus connected to our, our site was, is really important. Kick the tires, feel it, touch it, see it. It changes lots of other things. This is the back shot. All the landscape around the building is managed by students. They do the um, living machine, interior shot of the building. But again, it's, it's just a building. Run the film, fast forward. Uh, we started the Oberlin Project. I want to say just a few things about this. This was an attempt, as uh, Kate mentioned, to um, take everything you've ever heard about the word sustainability. It's a big, vague word. Nobody really knows what it means. And nobody knows what it certainly would mean if in fact it's a thousand year journey, uh, which, which I think it's gonna be. Uh, but it's a long term challenge. We're never gonna quite get there, but it's something you have to strive for. It's like truth and beauty and justice and so forth. It's one of these things out there you have to strive for. But we have to figure out if you, sustainability isn't what you strive for first, it's make it clean, green, safe, fair, decent. It'll be sustainable. So it, it's the end of that equation. It's the, right, it's the thing that appears on the right-hand side of the equal marks. So the Open Project was an attempt to, or it's an ongoing organization. We've now spent about $106 million of investment money and other monies to change Oberlin to be a model of sustainability. And the goal was to have 1,000 students from the college work on this, this effort. So working with people who are uh, engineers and city planners and architects and so forth and Maya Lynn's on campus tomorrow to help us with some of the landscape. She's doing the landscape uh, part of the project. She's the one, if you don't know the name, that did the Vietnam Memorial as a student uh, uh, undergraduate project. Uh, incredible designer, but uh, wh what's occurred is a city community college collaborative to make Oberlin a zero carbon community, eliminate all of our fossil fuels. In the utility, we've eliminated 90% of uh, fossil fuels already. Uh, rebuild the economy, make it sustainable, uh, create a local food system that provides 70, up to 70% of our foods locally, and then do the whole thing as an educational venture. Tell the truth, but then redirect all that anxiety 
to something that is productive and possible and something people can engage in, something they can see and touch and feel and experience. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the project we'll finish later this year or through the spring of 2016. This is a hotel and the college owns everything in this block. This is a 13 acre block. If you know the campus, as a couple of you do, uh, Tappan Square is to the left side of the, uh, the picture here and Tappan Square is 13 acres and this is the other block also owned by the college. Uh, we didn't set out to build a hotel, but I will tell you the backstory of this uh, is this. There was this awful little hotel sitting there. If you've been to Oberlin, you know the, what I'm talking about. It was built in 1955 as a uh, interstate uh, uh, motel. And it was built to the rigorous aesthetic and performance and comfort standards of interstate motels in 1955. <laughs> My boss, I worked for the, mostly for the, the president of the college. He is an attorney, uh, had been the chief attorney for uh, University of Michigan before he came to Oberlin and he was an audience about this size a little bit bigger and I was talking about this project and I said the Oberlin Inn as it now exists is a plausible excuse for limited nuclear war <laughs> and right after I was walking out of the podium he hustled up to me and people were getting up and leaving and so forth he said David don't ever say that again so I don't uh, <laughs> uh, but the the point of this I is this, and, and what this does for us is a couple things. And the ba by the way, the backstory is that the Oberlin trustees met uh, for their fall board meeting. You remember the bed bug infestation we had, what, seven years ago or so? Up and down the East Coast, it hit New York City hard. Well, they got out to Oberlin, <laughs> and uh, they infested the, uh, the hotel the weekend of the board meeting. And I was on a plane uh, going to San Francisco on Monday morning with one of the board members, and uh, he claimed to have been bitten 37 times. And so the, the idea of replacing the Oberlin Inn bumped up to the top of the priority <laughs> list. So uh, there was a backstory. But for us, it worked because it, this was the linchpin of this larger vision, the narrative behind the hotel. It was this larger vision. Can we build in a way that is powered entirely by sunshine or renewable energy? Uh, can we hit the U.S. Green Building Council platinum standard, and can we make this a driver in the local economy? And then there's a fourth goal. If you, if you know Oberlin, and I don't have a, a picture I didn't include in this slide deck, but at that far corner is one of the great art museums in higher education, the Allen Art Museum. And it's one of the, uh, it's ranked behind Harvard and Yale and Williams, and then there's a bunch of us down here, but we're in the top five of those teaching art museums. The middle building, which you can just barely see, is Hall Auditorium. That's a performing arts center, a uh, great performing arts center. Oberlin students, this sounds like an advertisement, but it, and it is. Uh, they do a great job. I mean, it, it is a wonderful performance space. And then there's this lousy little hotel. So it wasn't built it and they will come. They already come, but they got no good place to stay. And the, the goal here for me, and then there's the Oberlin uh, Conservatory of Music and uh, the fact that we turn out more kids who go on for PhDs in the sciences than any other small liberal arts college in the country. There's a mixture of lots of different things there. Can we change the dialogue about sustainability so that it becomes a mixture of art, music, poetry, culture, and oh, by the way, the building's powered by sunshine. And uh, people like me, or uh, my granddaughter, uh, Elaine, my granddaughter, came up and after a talk when she was, I gave once when she was six, and it was all about these things, and, and uh, she was holding her pet giraffe, and she said, uh, Granddad, I really liked your talk, but her pet giraffe was George or something like that. I said, but George thought your talk was boring, <laughs> and uh, we took her out of the will at that time, so <laughs> she, uh, but she was right, and, and you, you can add parts per million, parts per billion, ocean acidification, it's boring stuff, right? And we, we sound in this movement that are concerned about climate change too much like Presbyterian. You wag your finger and you got to do this and this and this and this. But can we make this discussion, this debate, this conversation about human survival on the planet, can we make it a celebration that includes art and poetry and music and locally grown organic foods? I mean, can we make this a bit of fun? And I think the answer is, yeah, we can. So this, this is a conversation changer for us. And on the... Uh, the left side here, just to explain what this is, this is a conference center uh, being a program, major events. One month before the uh, presidential election in 2016, we're going to have a conference on the next economy that will feature a number of prominent people, nationally prominent people. Uh, this is the interior space. This is the entry to a jazz club. This is hotel, commercial space. Uh, this is where Maya Lin's uh, work will be displayed, and uh, that's, that's what we're doing. 
I had students work on the project, again, working with some of the great architects and engineers and urban thinkers of the time, and I think that's, uh, that's important. Across the street from that, this was a space that was a, an abandoned Buick dealership, a dry cleaner that had spilled perchloroethylene all over the, the city, and an abandoned fast food joint. Three of my former students bought this uh, space and turned it into 33 condominiums, commercial space, and this anchors the downtown economy. It's, it was great. That's the three of them. They've gone off to do, uh, they started a development company, done uh, one big project in Cleveland with another on the way right now. Uh, Josh, Naomi, and Ben, and they're incredible stories. And the point of this is the kids don't have to be 55 and at the threshold of their you know, first heart attack to do great things in the world. They can begin early. And so to get young people involved in activities, uh, and at, at the age bracket you deal with, I had a student from a school in New Jersey uh, come in and come to my office. He was visiting campus, looking at the campus, and he was telling about how he had forced his, <laughs> his principal to solarize their school. Well, as things work out, uh, his principal was on campus for a conference a couple weeks later, and I happened to introduce himself to him. I said, uh, do you know such and such? He said, oh, yeah, that kid's a pain in the ass. I said, well, why? We, oh, he made us solarize, put solar collectors on the school. We didn't want to do that. Leadership uh, can sometimes come in all sizes and ages and varieties, but leadership is important in this. Uh, this is a uh, groundbreaking for a home for, this is the, the mother. She was a uh, woman below the poverty line. These are her two daughters here. This is groundbreaking on this house that we completed uh, about a month ago. Entirely solar powered house. This is the back of it, by the way. I couldn't get a good view of the front. But uh, this is an entirely solar-powered house built to the German passive house standard. Our goal is to build 50 of these for and work with low-income housing in the Oberlin community to show that all this ecological design and solar stuff and climate stuff actually works below the poverty line. Uh, this is a 2.27-megawatt uh, uh, array on 11 acres we uh, deployed three years ago. And part of the good news here is that had we done this last summer, the cost of doing this would have been half of what we paid three years ago. Uh, the cost of uh, photovoltaics is in free fall. This is kind of a summary of what we've done to date. But the point is to take this project, the Oberlin project, and to make this uh, part of an educational venture in the community, to transform the community using an educational institution, in this case Oberlin College, as the driver. We're one of these anchor institutions. We're going to be there, like your school is going to be there for a long time. And we have the power, we have respect, we have money, we have budgets and so forth. We, we have a lot of assets that can drive the process. Um, the next step up is to, we're part of the, the Lake Erie Crescent, so the next project that we're working on right now is, we call it the Lake Erie Crescent Project. This is Flint, Michigan up here, uh, where the mayor of the city told me that their tax base falls 20% per year. That's a city in financial freefall. Detroit, you've heard about Toledo and so forth, all the way over to Youngstown, Ohio here. Youngstown, Ohio, in 1941, was the wealthiest city per capita in the United States, Youngstown, Ohio. If you go there now, it's like the German army marched through in 1943 and it's never been rebuilt since. It is decimated, but the same is largely true of parts of Cleveland, a good bit of Toledo and Detroit, you've already heard about, it's always in the news, and then there's Flint, Michigan. So the goal here is again to use, very quickly, do the same thing but at a larger scale. Take the buying power and investing power of the 25 colleges and universities, University of Michigan, Michigan State, uh, Case Western Reserve, uh, University of Toledo, and begin to harness that buying and investing power to begin to change the region. Keep the money local. How many of you can recall Jane Jacobs' work? Uh, all right, the rest of you need to read Jane Jacobs. Uh, that's what professors do. We, we assign reading and we give tests, so you'll get a test in the mail. Uh, she thought, she said that national economies don't grow. What grows are city regions. And they grow by a process that she described as import substitution. So if you need it, buy it locally. And by local, if you, if, you, if you build it, make it, process it, service it, repair it locally, buy it locally. Keep your money within the local economy and take advantage of the multiplier effect. So our next issue is to begin to um, pull together a group of uh, CFOs and CIOs and begin to shift money that's already in play uh, for food and for energy and infrastructure back into the local economy. Uh, this is, uh, these are kind of other anchor institutions we're starting the conversations with, but these are our target areas throughout that uh, Lake Erie Crescent uh, economy. Um, 
the collateral benefits of doing this uh, resemble some of those that we, we experienced on the Lewis Center. Uh, it lowers crime rates, it creates local employment, it lowers carbon emissions, it cleans up hair, air, improves health, and so forth. Um, now, what do you tell your students? Um, first of all, why tell them anything? And the point of, uh, I'd like to make with this slide is very simply that this disorder outside started with a prior disorder in how we think and what we think about. And so that puts it into our bailiwick. And then this is everything that happens in your curriculum and in mine, everything, is in part education about the environment. We teach people they're part of or a part from. And it's in every course, it's in every department, it's in every discipline. So what do you teach them? Well, quick list, teach them to be ecologically competent. And by that, one way to describe this is get them to pay attention to the slow things and give them the analytical skills necessary to understand those slow variables because they do become the headlines. So uh, geochemical cycles, pay attention to carbon, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus also, soil loss and soil erosion, social trends that are critical, literacy and poverty particularly important. And uh, if I put uh, 400 people uh, in this room, which we could easily do, uh, they would have, the right 400 people would have more net wealth than the bottom 185 million Americans. If you put 85 people in this room worldwide, you'd have, they would have more wealth than the bottom 3.7 billion people on the planet. Um, ecological competence. This is the front page of the New Yorker uh, years back. Uh, this is taken from the tale of the jinn, the old Islamic tale where humankind is in the dock on trial, the question for the animals given voice, and sentient is, uh, should humans survive on planet Earth? Teach them to be defenders of humankind. Understand what case can be made for us. So this big word, sustainability. Uh, other than the fact we want to be sustained, why do we deserve to be sustained? And if we better knew why we deserve to be sustained, I think we'd know better how to actually go about being sustained. Get them involved in design. Uh, everything that they do is a design effort. But design is different, ecological design is different than design. Ecological design is about making things that fit in the culture. Design failures, see the world as design. What ails us isn't a matter of evil. It, nobody intended this necessarily. But see this as design failures so that we spend about 3,200 pounds of stuff to put one product, one pound of product on the store shelf. Design failure. We know better. We know how to do that better. Uh, we put a calorie of food on the plate here at Mohawk or about anywhere but we expend somewhere between 11 and 70 calories of fossil fuel energy to get it to the plate. That's a design failure. We know how to do better than that. In security, I've asked students uh, for years, if they were given $15,000 a second, how would they propose to make us secure at half or a third or a quarter of the cost of that 1.3 trillion that we spend on something we call defense? Design principles, you all know them. Uh, these are the ones that came out of the Hanover World's Fair 20 years ago. Uh, but it's very simple. Think of whole systems powered by sunshine, protect diversity, pay the whole cost of things. But, but we know these things. Get them involved in the design revolution. If they go into economics and business, get them to remember that we pay for sustainability whether you get it or not. Uh, but you pay in different currencies. You pay in terms of lost lives and health and security and environment and social stability and so forth. Get them to be problem solvers, but not the old way but a new way that solves what Wendell Berry, the great writer, calls solving for pattern. Don't cause new problems. Get them to see the problem of unsustainability or the issues of sustainability as systemic problems. Make them systems thinkers. To see patterns that connect all the things around us, in Greg Bateson's work. Make them silo busters. Help them connect these disparate disciplines and courses. So think across lines. What should people trained in economics know about ecology? or about ethics, or about anything else. And get them to be uh, partners in this, what Edmund Burke, the founder of modern conservatism, in this wonderful book called Reflections on the Revolution in France, written in 1790, described as this intergenerational transfer. He was the founder of modern conservatism, yet he was saying that we in the current generation are just trustees, midway between a distant past and a distant future. And our job is to pass on that inheritance, that entailed inheritance that he described from one generation to the next. That included culture, religion, government, all the things that we value in life, but also the ecological requisites on which those rest. And then get them to value words. 
I've never seen an age, I couldn't recall an age when language was more abundant but used with less care and precision. This is an age in which language, how did the word conservatism apply to people willing to run the risk of the health of the planet and ignore climate change? That isn't conservative. I don't know what your politics are and I don't care. That is a terrible use of that word. That is a very good word. And how did the word liberal become demonized? Those are flip sides of the same coin. And uh, more are said on that later if you want. But that's, that is careless use of language. Teach them to be lovers of language. And then finally, teach them that hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. If they are optimistic or if you are optimistic, they or you don't know enough. But if you go into despair, that's a sin, don't go there. And that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if you're at either of those extremes, you won't do anything. You will only act. They will only act if they're hopeful. They have to act. That's required. So what's it look like? Well, it looks like this. The price of photovoltaics and energy falling is in free fall. If we had done that PV array again uh, last year, it would have been half of what we paid three years before. Renewable energy is breaking out all over. It's starting at the low base, but think of where cell phones were 25 years ago. Uh, this is the top of Walmart. Business is beginning to put money, whatever you think of Walmart, uh, businesses are beginning to buy renewable energy, as is the U.S. military, the two largest buyers of photovoltaic cells. Solar photovoltaic capacity, solar electric systems going up uh, uh, so dramatically. The same is true with wind power. Uh, the same is true with plug-in vehicles. All the curves, are the right curves are actually going up dramatically. Pope Francis changed the dialogue, I hope, in this country and worldwide. Uh, it hasn't quite dented some parts of the U.S. yet, but it will. I think the force of Pope Francis' message is incredible. The divest and reinvest movement is alive and well. This happens to be a picture of Harvard, but it's breaking out on schools everywhere, including Oberlin. This is a group that won a court case that grants young people standing on issues of climate change. This is a group in uh, The Hague in the Netherlands that won a similar case against their government. This is a group a couple weeks ago out in California, Sonoma State, that have uh, a group of kids that just graduated from Sonoma State that have started a, their own farm enterprise. It's happening all over. And finally, let me say this. What do they do with their lives? Uh, well, that, that's kind of the big question, isn't it? We talk a lot about careers, and uh, they encourage them not to have a career first, have a life first, which means get a calling, find out why they're on the earth, what really satisfies them, what gives them joy in life, and get them involved in it. Unfortunately, this is not necessarily what's happening in higher education for lots of reasons. This is uh, data that's uh, a few years old, but it's roughly the same at the present. This is uh, kids wanting to be well off financially. This number's gone up. This number developed a meaningful for philosophy of life. This number's gone down. Part of that reflects the fact that they, on average, now graduate with a fairly steep lean on future income. They graduate from colleges in debt. That should not be. Every kid that comes out of colleges ought to be free of charge. Uh, higher education ought to be free of charge. We ought to give every American a sabbatical leave. I don't care what their occupation, if they go to a, take a class in a local college. Um, Thomas Merton, who Pope Francis describes as one of the four Americans uh, that he highlighted, uh, said this. Uh, he was asked after he wrote his uh, best-selling memoirs, uh, uh, asked by Columbia his uh, alma mater to describe the roots of his success. And this, is in, this was penned in the letter he wrote back to Columbia University. He said, tell Columbia students to be anything like be madmen, drunks, and bastards of every shape and form. He was a, a monk. But at all costs, avoid one thing, success. And I think that's the message of William Teresa Witt's book. Uh, I think that's the message, one of the messages I want to leave with you. This is too serious a time. Success is always defined in the rearview mirror. It's by a standard that was set a long time ago. In our culture, it's been money and fame and, and celebrity. Now we need a generation of young people that are coming into this world that understand a different way to be successful. It is to help the world through this transitional time. That's their great work. And the careers, uh, there are so many, we wouldn't even begin to name them, but here's a short list. You can make a much longer list of this. They can find a place where words count. If they want to make money, fine. Do it the way Ray Anderson at Interface Carpet Corporation did it. Do it the right way. Uh, but whatever the career that they want to pursue, and it begins to emerge in, in students in your schools, make sure that that career includes the biggest issues on the human agenda. And then I think that this says it, it all. Uh, they, you, I, all of us now need a sense of urgency 
uh, described in Martin Luther King's words. There is such a thing, he said, as being too late. Procrastination is a thief of time. Lof life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of man doesn't remain at the flood. It ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. Of the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. A sense of urgency about everything that we do, the way you run your schools, the way you teach, the way we do all of our work. Uh, two last thoughts. This big fuzzy word, sustainability, nobody really knows what it means. But I think Robert Fulgham, in his wonderful little book, All I Really Needed to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten, got the essence of it. We knew all of these things a long time ago. Just make it across generational boundaries. Make it fit everything. And make it, uh, in effect, I think, for all of the, the enterprise of life. We now understand that life is more complicated than we thought. Something like sentience pervades the entire ecosphere. We don't have words for it. When Ralph Waldo em Emerson penned the words that we live in the lap of great intelligence, I think he was getting at this phenomenon. Courtesy and decency matter. And then finally, for, uh, for your work and for mine and so forth, I think we have to ask, what is education for? If it's not about success as conventionally defined, and not about just careers, not about mastery of nature, I think Albert Einstein had it right. It is to widen the circles of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. Thank you all for the work that you do toward this end. Thank you.